Uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? Welcome everyone to the Hoover Institutions Program, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers versus Hawks. Are regulatory agencies' jurisdictional determinations immune to immediate judicial review? That's the question before us. I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President, Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. I am here pinch hitting for my very good friend Adam White, who sends his best regards, wishes he could be here, but he's out of town. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and I thank, <coughs> thank you all for coming today. Uh, as the title of our program indicates, we're of course going to discuss the Hawks <coughs> case, uh, jurisdictional determinations, judicial review, final agency action, discharges and permits, but we're also going to be talking about environmental law more generally and agency law, administrative law. So I'm going to leave it to our experts to describe the case, uh, talk about the issues there and give their views in their opening remarks. Uh, but the discussion and the audience Q&A is going to be a big part of our program today. So as we move along, think about the questions you might ask of our experts uh, when we get to that part of the program. Uh, their longer bios, I think, have already been provided to you. So I'm going to be very brief in my introductions. I'll go in the order they're going to give their opening remarks. We're going to hear first from Reed Hopper. Uh, Reed Hopper serves as principal attorney in the Environmental Law Practice Group of the Pacific Legal Foundation. Perhaps most importantly for our purposes today, Mr. Hopper is counsel of record for Hawks Company and will argue the case before the Supreme Court next Wednesday, March 30th. My first question for you is what are you doing here if you have an argument next week? Uh, we'll hear then from, uh, second from uh, Professor William Busby. Professor Busby is from Georgetown University Law Center where he teaches environmental law, administrative law, legislation and regulation, and constitutional law subjects, all of which are relevant to us today here. Uh, he's also a founding member scholar of the Center for Progressive Reform. And finally, we'll hear from Ilya Shapiro. Ilya Shapiro is a senior fellow in constitutional studies at the Cato Institute, where he also serves as editor-in-chief of the very well-regarded Cato Supreme Court Review. He also directs Cato Institute's extensive activities before the Supreme Court, including a brief in this case. So with that, Reed Hopper, opening remarks, please. Thank you. Well, I, I would like to thank you for the invitation. It's certainly a wonderful to be here. Um, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, where I come from, we have a saying that it takes a pretty good meeting to be better than no meeting at all. Uh, and, and I hope that if you find this interesting, if not entertaining, um, I, I used to work for the Coast Guard, and I was a hearing officer, and ironically, uh, my job there was to enforce the Clean Water Act, and in particular, I assigned uh, penalties for violations of the act. I found that from time to time disturbing because it seemed to me to be, uh, on many occasions, uh, really quite unjust. As you may know, the Clean Water Act is a strict liability uh, statute. Uh, you don't have to prove intent if one violates uh, the law by discharging uh, to a, a water of the United States without uh, federal approval, that's a per se violation. Um, but I recall being at a training meeting on one occasion and I raised this question uh, to the instructor, what do you do if you're an agency and you're required to enforce what you think is a bad law? And the response was, well, you got two choices. You can either ignore it or you uh, enforce the heck out of it so people scream so loud that Congress does something about it. And I think in this case, uh, the Corps and the EPA have chosen the latter approach. Uh, they, they like to see the people scream. I'm not so sure that they're uh, interested in change, however. One of the amici uh, raised an interesting argument, a separation of powers argument um, in, the, in the case, and uh, we had not addressed that uh, in our briefing, but I think it, it may serve as a, as a framework for my comments as we kind of kick this discussion off today, uh, because the jurisdictional determination, I think, is emblematic uh, of the, one of the problems with the Clean Water Act. Um, under the Clean Water Act, through the jurisdictional determination program, the Corps and the EPA assume a, a legislative role. Uh, they're allowed to essentially define uh, their own authority by passing a, uh, uh, a general rule of applicability uh, or on a case-by-case -case basis through individual jurisdictional determinations. They also exercise their, the, the executive branch power uh, 
because they control the process itself, how the uh, jurisdictional determination uh, is going to uh, be applied, uh, how it, what procedures may apply, um, if any subsequent uh, permit is, uh, is required, then they can completely control uh, the timing of the cost and the process. And then thirdly, uh, they actually <coughs> assume kind of a judicial role in the sense that in this particular case, um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers versus Hawks, the government's position is that jurisdictional determinations are not reviewable in court. So their actions should be shielded uh, from the judicial branch. So that takes away really any um, uh, separation of power, um, any check and, and balance that ought to be involved in this process. And in my view, that's a prescription for arbitrary government, and that gives us a cause for pause, or a cause for pause. With respect to the legislative um, uh, role, <clears throat> Let me just review with you uh, uh, the history uh, of the act. It was, the Clean Water Act was initially promulgated in 1972, known as the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. And at that time, Corps of Engineers took the view uh, that, the, that uh, the prohibition for, for discharging to navigable waters meant traditional navigable waters. Uh, those types of channels on which one could float a boat and which could be used for interstate commerce, which had been the normal uh, meaning and definition of that term for 150 years prior. By 1985, in a case called Riverside Bay Bayview, uh, the Corps of Engineers was claiming that they could regulate wetlands uh, that abut or um, are adjacent to a traditional navigable waters. Uh, they took that decision, which was favorably decided, uh, for them uh, as kind of carte blanche. Uh, by uh, 2001, the Corps of Engineers was regulating so-called isolated water bodies, those that had no hydrological connection to a navigable water whatsoever. In fact, the court uh, said that they had, that the Corps had read the term navigable waters right out of the act and concluded that they had no authority to regulate uh, isolated pools and ponds uh, that were not uh, uh, connected to open waters. In 2006, um, uh, now enters uh, the Rapanos case, which I had the privilege of arguing in the Supreme Court. And by that time, the agency uh, uh, was, was arguing that it could regulate anything that had a hydrological connection to a downstream navigable water, uh, meaning uh, any, uh, any tributary and any adjacent uh, wetland. And uh, so, so it was quite broad. However, the Supreme Court uh, concluded that that went too far, that they could not regulate all navigable waters and certainly not all uh, adjacent uh, um, water bodies. And then you're all aware, I think, that uh, in uh, um, the middle of 2015, the Corps of Engineers and the EPA have issued a new rule redefining waters of the United States, which is to say they're redefining once again their own authority under the Clean Water Act. And they've done this in such a way that, it, that although they claim to be implementing the 2001 Swank decision and the 2006 Rapanos decision, they're doing just the opposite. They've essentially adopted uh, the uh, minority view, the dissenting view in Rapanos, and assert jurisdiction over all tributaries in the country and virtually any water within 4,000 feet of such a, a tributary. So that's how <clears throat> the, the agency is exerting its legislative power, um, which it has no right to do, uh, but the, the uh, Clean Water Act was so poorly written and uh, so ambiguously written that it allows, with a little collusion from the courts, this type of broad interpretation until a court says no more. Uh, with respect to their executive um, uh, power, the, the Corps of Engineers has taken a very heavy-handed approach. Uh, there's no news here. Uh, you may recall uh, the Sackett case uh, 
uh, upon which uh, we're building. This is sort of a follow-up case, this Hawks case, um, different uh, in, uh, in some of its particulars, but the analysis that, that the Supreme Court applied in determining uh, whether the agency action was subject to judicial review is essentially the same. And let me just fill you in on, that, on, on what happened there. Sackets were a young couple. They had a small half-acre lot uh, in Idaho near Priest Lake. Uh, they wanted to build a home on it. This was in an already built-out subdivision. There were just a couple of empty lots. This was one of them. They put some gravel on there. And then the, the same day, the EPA shows up uh, and, and issues a verbal cease and desist order. And then uh, the, for the next six months, uh, the uh, Sackett, this young couple, was sitting on pins and needles trying to figure out what the basis was for the jurisdiction. And then about six months later, they get what's called a compliance order. Compliance order doesn't really explain itself. It just declares unilaterally uh, that, uh, that the Sacketts had discharged to a, uh, a navigable water and in that they uh, allegedly filled in a wetland without a permit. Um, they were required under the compliance order uh, to remove the gravel, uh, to revegetate, to return the, the property to its pristine status, to fence it off, to monitor it for three years, uh, to pay a fine, to, to provide off-site mitigation, to provide 24-7 access to the site, um, and uh, also uh, they would be accruing uh, fines at the rate of $37,500 a day. However, if they didn't comply with the compliance order, there would be another 37500 a day tacked on. So all told, by the time we took that case to the Supreme Court, claiming that, that, that uh, the Sacketts should have a right to go to court to question the jurisdiction of the EPA, um, the fines had potentially accumulated to about half a billion dollars. And that's one of the reasons why the court took the case, no doubt. It was a very sympathetic situation. Um, hopefully, uh, <clears throat> in the eyes of the court, will be the, the court the justices will feel this is equally sympathetic. Uh, here's what's going on <clears throat> um, now with respect to the jurisdictional determination, which is now at issue in, in this case. <clears throat> and let me first mention another related case, uh, which we were involved in. <clears throat> Uh, in in uh, the Fifth Circuit has issued a ruling um, favorable to the government uh, saying that jurisdictional determinations, which is a, a, a delineation uh, of uh, waters of the United States that's a, a formal uh, written document provided by, uh, by the court, that that was not reviewable under the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, the facts of the case are these. Um, the Bell Company owned some property in uh, um, uh, one of the uh, uh, parishes uh, near um, New Orleans in Louisiana, and they had, pro had provided an option to purchase uh, to Kent Recycling. Kent Recycling was going to uh, use the property to install a, a, essentially a solid waste disposal uh, facility, but the site did have wetlands on it, However, the, uh, up until the time <clears throat> that they went for uh, a permit from the state, this had always been treated by the Corps of Engineers and the EPA as agriculturally exempt. The Clean Water Act does not cover all waters. There are some statutory exemptions, and they felt that their land fell under that statutory agricultural exemption. The, uh, when the jurisdictional determination was issued, the, uh, the agency ignored that exemption, claimed it didn't apply, uh, changing the rules in the middle of the game. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the landowners and uh, Kent Recycling petitioned that or appealed that administratively within the court itself. And the hearing officer determined uh, that the jurisdictional determination had been improperly issued because the agency had misapplied the law and the facts did not support the conclusion that, that, that uh, the waters on the site constituted 
jurisdictional waters or waters of the United States. Uh, <clears throat> so that went to court. Uh, Kent Recycling sought to have that, have that reviewed, and uh, the district court said, don't have that opportunity, no such right uh, under the Administrative Procedure Act because the jurisdictional determination does not constitute final agency action. That went to the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit agreed, and we took the case on at that time and petitioned to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court turned down our petition for review, <clears throat> but something unusual happened uh, in the weeks following, and that is the Hawks case came about. We represented the Hawks case in the Eighth Circuit, and the facts were quite similar. Hawks <clears throat> um, is a peat mining oper operation, wanted to expand their, uh, their harvesting of uh, peat moss, which is a soil amendment. And uh, on a nearby uh, parcel, uh, they went to uh, the state and to uh, uh, the Corps uh, to see if uh, any permits were required. They started the permit process, but the Corps immediately became adversarial and uh, started to try to sabotage the project um, imposed uh, uh, costs that uh, became excessive, made it clear that they probably would not grant the permit even, if, even after years of review and hundreds of thousands of dollars you know, uh, of, of expenditure. So as in the Kent recycling case, Hawks appealed uh, the jurisdictional determination uh, administratively, and again, the reviewing officer concluded uh, that the district engineer who issued the uh, uh, jurisdictional determination ter 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 had done so inappropriately, that it was invalid uh, because there was insufficient evidence to support the agency conclusion that these wetlands um, had a sig significant nexus to downstream navigable waters, as was required under the, the Rapanos decision. So <clears throat> uh, we, uh, we took that to the, uh, to the Eighth Circuit, and the Eighth Circuit ruled in, in favor of Hawks. So now we have a split, and we were able to raise the, uh, the existence of that uh, conflict uh, to the Supreme Court. The result was that ultimately <clears throat> the court decided to hold on to the Kent recycling case, uh, even though it had initially denied the petition for review until this case is decided. And then at, at the request of both the Corps and ourselves, uh, the court granted review in, in, this, in the Hawks case. So we have a, a conflict there, and that's a primary basis for the court to grant review. I should also add there's kind of a three-way conflict uh, because the Ninth Circuit in Fairbanks uh, uh, also ruled on this issue prior to the Sackett case and concluded that there was no right for uh, judicial review of, uh, of a jurisdictional determination. The yellow so, light's on, Reed. Sorry? The yellow light's on. Okay. <laughs> Very good. I'll try to finish up real, here real quick. Um, with respect to the judicial uh, exercise of, of the agency's power, um, the Supreme Court noted in the Rapanos case uh, that the terms that the agency applied to determine jurisdiction were purposely left vague so that uh, the officers uh, could um, interpret them as broadly as they wanted. Uh, and uh, it le that left to a great deal of inconsistency in how the act was applied. In fact, uh, they cited a 2004 GAO audit that said that uh, uh, the, the course, um, if you look at uh, and officers within three different districts, ask them what constituted const, uh, uh, a regulated water and they'd give you three different answers. And uh, so what we have going here is that uh, um, the agency uh, virtually had a blank check um, through the vagueness of its own um, regulations <coughs> to decide on a case-by-case -case basis which waters were going to be subject to judicial review. And that meant that when it came to uh, being reviewed by a court, the court would give uh, the agency maximum deference. And so they really do uh, have this problem of, 
of uh, exercising all three powers, uh, legislative, executive, and judicial, which we think really undermines the intent of, of the uh, separation of powers that's provided in the Constitution. And that's really one of the reasons why we're advancing this case and trying to get the court to allow review of jurisdictional determinations nationwide. And I should add that the, that the agency has indicated that it, it issues these uh, jurisdictional determinations in, in, the, in the amount of tens of thousands per year. This case will have uh, a significant a effect on literally millions of landowners throughout the country. Thank you. Professor Busby. Um, well, um, thanks to Adam White, who's not here, for inviting me to participate. Um, but I'm just curious who I'm speaking with. So how many people here are lawyers? <laughs> That's OK. I'm a law professor. I, I don't mind that. Um, and then uh, how many of you, before you walked in here, were already immersed in the situation and the questions in Hawks? Only a few of you. OK. Um, well, I think Reed did a great job in kind of framing the issues. but because of what I just learned about that people's backgrounds, I'm going to also maybe fill in a little bit of context about the legal issues and their implications in this case. Um, and so uh, I've read Reed's brief in this case. He wrote a powerful brief, uh, a lot of, also had a lot of uh, powerful um, aligned uh, friend of court briefs. Um, the United States also did a good job in this brief. So uh, it's a good case to learn a lot about the administrative state, environmental law, and also arguments about the benefits and harms of regulation. Now, um, what I thought I'd do is I'll first discuss kind of just under the law where I think the law should come out. So I'll discuss a few of the cases. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about this case and as being a part of reg reform and some anti-regulatory advocacy and talk about how I think maybe a victory in this case, if Reed and his interests win, actually is going to have a very harmful effect for those who most want to get a break from regulation. Um, and it really has to do with just following through, thinking about the incentives created by different potential uh, legal rules about access to the courts. Um, so let me start at first. Um, you know, this case, as we did a nice job in framing, uh, is uh, the latest in a number of cases dealing with the Clean Water Act, the reach of the Clean Water Act, what is protected as a water of the United States. There are three major Supreme Court cases on this each of which has sown some. The first one was unanimous. The second one, uh, because of some maybe poorly articulated arguments, the second one swank, uh, left some big questions open. The third one, importantly, actually had no majority opinion. So when Reed referred to the Rapanos court, it actually is not the Rapanos. He was quoting and paraphrasing a plurality opinion only had four justices. There actually were two majorities of justices aligned on what kinds of waters are protected, uh, but there was no majority opinion. And that's part of the reason there's been some uncertainty. Uh, but the next big case that this is really is building on, and I think very intelligently he and his uh, allies and these efforts have built on, is this so-called the Sackett case, the one that dealt with the administrative consent order uh, where EPA claimed there was no right to judicial review, and the Supreme Court quite clearly and resoundingly said, you're wrong. Um, and so um, one thing that was left out of um, Reed's discussion that I think is important to understand is where this so-called jurisdictional determination fits in the whole regulatory regime. And here's the way it fits. So if someone has a piece of a, a land that, that usually is land and water or something that looks like water, and the question is, is it subject to federal jurisdiction? When someone refers to something being a water of the United States, and everyone writes it down as WOTUS and all the articles and the rest. So if you're looking for law on this, just type in WOTUS in all caps, and you'll find dozens of articles and uh, position papers. But if someone is trying to figure out if they're subject to federal jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act, the question is, are they subject to permit obligations under the Clean Water Act? And those come primarily in two forms. There's some other provisions on oil spills and like, but it's two forms. One has to do with dredge and fill permits. Uh, those are handled by the Army Corps of Engineers, usually where someone wants to dig something up or fill it in. If you want to take the Hudson River and build a highway on it, which some people proposed in the 70s, that large concrete would be, area would be fill. That would require a Section 404 permit. 
Section 402 is if someone wants to discharge pollutants through a point source into a water of the United States, they have to get a permit. That's handled by EPA. So whether something is a jurisdictional water is the foundational prerequisite for the protections of the Clean Water Act. And that's why this is so important. Um, when someone wants to find out if they're subject to federal jurisdiction, um, at this point, the Army Corps has, for years, through a guidance document, something it informally decided to provide, has provided the service that it will go out and it will give people different levels of potential advice about their views of the status of this land or water when people are trying to figure that out. And this is the jurisdictional determination assessment. Um, no one is required to seek it. The Army Corps is not required to give it. Uh, the Army Corps also can sometimes will just give what's called a preliminary determination where it gives a sort of, it's, it's a less formal, it's a, it can be very informal or it can be partially formal, uh, where they give their preliminary assessment. No one claims that that's final, but it will sometimes do what's referred to as a full jurisdictional, or he call, we do call it a formal, I don't think they call that, but a jurisdictional determination uh, where they go through and they actually decide to say affirmative, meaning it's subject to federal protection, or they declare negatively and they say it's not subject to federal jurisdiction. And the question then is, after that, but before someone has decided if they want a permit under the Clean Water Act, are they subject to a challenge in the courts? That is, someone unhappy with what the Army Corps has done, can they go to the courts right then? And, and Reed is arguing they should be able to the court, go to the courts right then. Um, under the case law, um, uh, I, think it's, I think there's a decent chance that they would get a favorable ruling. However, I think it quite clearly would go beyond any current cases that we have. Um, the main cases that you have that are the, the precedents relating to this, the, the most important precedent is the Sackett case that he mentioned, the administrative consent order. The Supreme Court in that case, every opinion, it was unanimous court with a couple separate opinions, um, said, EPA said you either restore the water that had been illegally filled right away or you face daily penalties that accumulate. Okay? So in action, that administrative consent order, by its very fact, that action created an obligation to act or increasing penalties. And the Supreme Court emphasized that repeatedly in the opinion. So it was that what people would refer to as a Hobson's choice. You couldn't win either way. Right? That, that action automatically put people in an impossible position. Another case called Bennett versus Speer dealt with biological opinions and incidental take permits under the Endangered Species Act. And there the Supreme Court and it had to do with who could use waters and effects on, e on endangered species. And the Supreme Court said that there were immediate coercive impacts of the government action. Okay? And it emphasized that repeatedly, partly in standing discussion, partly in finality discussion. A case called Abbott Labs. If any of you are law students, you may remember Abbott Labs. This is a case with, it doesn't get better than that, does it? Drug labels. So it was a case involving drug labels, and Abbott Labs was told to either change its, its drug labels, or if it didn't, it was subject to criminal or civil violations for selling drugs without the required label. And the Supreme Court said people could bring an early challenge because they immediately face this Hobson's choice of penalties or um, or the obligation essentially to retool and put new labels on. There's also an obscure case, the Boston Marine case. I, I encourage all of you to figure out what it says because it's not easy to figure out, but it had to do with wharfage fees and then who would pay wharfage fees in connection with a maritime commission dispute and who in the end would bear the cost in the set, setting of a strike. Go figure. But in the case, it did basically say that the decision would be final in part because no matter what, someone would be paying. Like the ruling was going to create immediately obligations to pay. And so bottom line is the Sackett case, I mean sorry, the Hawks case is well short of these cases. There's no Hobson's choice. What they, people end up getting with a jurisdictional determination is they know the government's view about its having power and the private property owner knows that it is uh, likely subject to federal jurisdiction. No obligations flow from that determination. They don't have to do anything. They face no penalties. 
uh, they, if they decide to seek a permit, then within that they can continue to contest it. Um, now, permits are costly and they take time. And also, conceitedly, if someone is told that their land is subject to federal jurisdiction as a water, it surely re loses value, okay? Or if the market did not real, I mean, if the market's rational, the market will know the land is probably uh, a water, but, uh, but there's often uncertainty. So the regulatory action probably does incrementally decrease the value of the property because you have a considered opinion of experts that it's subject to federal jurisdiction. And the argument that uh, Reed and his uh, aligned friend of court brief writers argue is it's that combination of knowing that your property is subject to constraint and maybe the loss in value and the costs of seeking a permit add up to uh, harms akin to Sackett. My sense is it's going beyond Sackett. I'm not sure uh, if the Supreme Court will be willing to go that far. But let me talk, why would the Supreme Court be maybe reluctant to go this far? Um, it's important to think about cases not just through that case, but to always scale it up. Think about it as a national rule of decision that will affect all people subject to the law and who might want this kind of jurisdictional determination. Well, if you have such a ruling in the Hawks case, that means any time an agency gives a, an unrequired advance view about someone's status under the law, or their own power under the law to act, that that would become arguably subject to a new Hawks rule of getting judicial review, okay? And the problem with this is businesses want the kind of advanced guidance from agencies that the Army Corps has long provided. In fact, if any of you work under the Superfund law, between the 1980 and the late 1990s, the main argument of regulatory think tanks, the insurance industry, Republicans in the legislature, and some Democrats calling for reform as well, was that under Superfund law, people could not get advanced views from the government about the status of their land and liabilities that would go with it. Late 1990, Brownfield amendments changed the law so you could get some of this guidance, and it was viewed as a victory. And so what you're doing here is if every jurisdictional determination means the Army Corps goes to court, what will happen is the following. The Army Corps is likely not going to want to give such jurisdictional determination advice. So what will it likely do? It will become either it will decline to act, that's one possibility. It will act far more frequently in a preliminary way, which is less helpful for the business interests and property owners who want this kind of guidance. Another possibility is, that I think is actually a near certainty is more of the onus will be put on the person seeking the jurisdictional determination to provide the documentation that the government, because it has to factor in the cost of judicial review, will not want to squander its resources until they have some kind of filter that someone is for real in wanting to get this guidance. And, uh, and the Army Corps of Engineers is completely it can, it can completely fail, it can completely cease to give such jurisdictional determinations. It's done so and it's been a service, but if you're the loser on one of those efforts, then you can be like Mr. Hopper's clients. They're unhappy, but you have to remember that there are going to be hundreds of thousands and probably millions of other people over the years who have benefited from this advanced guidance. Because often what it does is it tell, tells people you can work with this part of your land and this part's carved out. So that clarity about what you can do usually is a pro-business sort of government function. Okay, um, lastly, um, you know, one thing just to think about here is kind of the overall incentives created um, and, uh, you know, why, and you didn't say why you guys brought the case. I think, I think you, you articulated the kind of the government is too powerful here argument. But I see several possible aspirations that the challengers have here, that why would they pursue this case? Um, one argument is they just think the Army Corps will do better, right? And so there is a possibility the Army Corps will say, this is what we're supposed to do, we think it's a good function, and we'll do it better because the courts will scrutinize our actions. I assume that's an optimistic view, is that, that the Army Corps will do better if subject to immediate judicial <coughs> scrutiny. Um, Maybe, um, 
But it is also the case that there's abundant evidence in administrative law scholarship. When you add process and you add regulatory burdens, what typically will happen is things slow down, lines build up, and the process becomes more costly. There's a large literature of this in connection with welfare. Uh, Jerry Mashaw wrote several books about this. Um, and so I think even if the Army Corps tries to do better, everything will slow down and it will become a little clunkier in the process. Um, second, I think a very likely thing, if I were, if the Army Corps were assessing in light of a Hawks ruling, what would they likely do? I think they probably would embed the, the jurisdictional determination within a 404 and a 402 permit determination. What they do is say, you can hire consultants, you can figure it out. When you really want to do something, tell us, and then we'll give you the guidance. That would be a way to conserve resources, kind of filter out people who may be on a whim, try to escape the law. I think that would be a very likely sort of outcome. Even if not officially done, I think there would be some sort of triaging on the of the regulatory sort where they probably would look at the really easy, like say definitely negative, or really clearly this is, this is called the Great Lakes. This is clearly a, a water of the United States. And what will happen is the ones where people want guidance most, the tough calls, those ones will slow down and become clunkier. And so that would be, I think that's a virtual certainty that would happen. Um, also, um, one thing that will make lawyers happy in the room, go lawyers, um, uh, and this is the following, uh, that remember if jurisdictional, det jurisdictional determinations become challengeable, negative declarations, when the Army Corps says it's not a water, the neighbors and the environmental groups and the eco-tourist groups and the hunting and fishing groups, they will be able to go to court and challenge it. So that will mean it will, it will, everyone will be going to court more often. And so uh, citizen, there's a case called Laid Law having to do with citizen suit standing. It made very clear if you're kind of an adjacent user and enjoyer of the water, you'll have standing uh, under the Clean Water Act. So I think you will have more litigation overall. I'm not sure people say that is beneficial. Um, Yellow light? Where am I? You're, you're a little past the yellow light. Though. Okay, okay. Everybody's going along. Okay. Um, we'll just be here till 7. I guess, <laughs> the, uh, I guess this is the last I don't thing I'd say. I have that much to say. <laughs> they're, they're covering it all. He seeds in a minute. So, so I guess I'd say last thing is just to, you know, the, the Hoover Institution is a, a long, powerful institution that has as a general view you need to think about economic impacts, incentives, and think about the benefits of business working well. And so one thing you need to think about is do markets work well in the area that we're talking about here, okay? And one of the things I was surprised at is in the friend of court briefs, a number of local governments file briefs, okay? And then in the, but in the briefs, what was striking was all they talked about is wanting to grant permits and wanting business vitality, which is of course important, but local governments and businesses also rely on clean water and lose when they have sullied water and other businesses will lose and jurisdictions spend more if they have to spend more money to clean water. Wetlands have been well documented to have filtering effects and be by far the most cost effective means to keep waters of the United States clean. Uh, a good friend of mine who's an industry lawyer at one of the largest law firms in the world had done work in Poland and then did work in China and years ago he was standing in a stream in upstate New York with me and he said, do you know that there's not a single river in Eastern Europe where you could swim in it? Not a single one. And he said, you know, but that's one of the things about the United States was, he's a Republican by the way, but he said the United States, um, you know, he said it is interesting and we've made it so the rivers are clean. So one thing you need to think about it in the Clean Water Act setting, the Hawks peat operation is itself small, maybe small potatoes, right? Small peat, I don't know. But the, uh, um, however, if you think about the functions wetlands fill or fulfill and you start thinking about all such actions and all such polluters and all such determinations, you have a setting of the classic tragedy of the commons. Lots of small impacts causing in aggregate substantial harms and also a setting where the market doesn't work unless people are forced to internalize the harms of what they cause, you know, forced to pay for the harms that they cause. So bottom line is, I think you play through the incentives, a victory for hawks would be a victory for hawks, but would largely be a loss for most of the businesses that have long come to rely on jurisdictional determinations and also might be a loss for the environment. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Ilya Shapiro. <laughs>
Uh, I will indeed be brief, uh, in part because our brief was brief, one of the shorter ones, uh, but also administrative law was my worst subject in law school, so I'm uh, amazed and grateful that the first time I get to speak at the August uh, Hoover Institution, um, it's, it's on uh, such a subject. Um, I also uh, am cognizant that uh, I'm one of the last things standing between you and the fine spread that's, uh, that's over there, uh, and so uh, I will be sensitive to that concern. Um, notably, uh, you know, I was talking to Todd Gaziano of PLF beforehand. Um, you know, it would have been better if they'd opened the wine and let the, especially the audience, uh, drink beforehand. Uh, I find that when my audience has had more to drink, uh, I'm more witty, but we'll have to um, uh, suffice without that. Well, look, um, any of you who were at Cato's event on this subject uh, last week uh, are going to uh, hear a bit of repetition because I think my colleague Trevor Burris uh, gave a, a nice complimentary presentation that, that complements what was discussed uh, here as well. We actually had a very hard time finding someone. We did ultimately did not find someone uh, to take the position that Professor Busby is taking here, supporting uh, the government effectively. We asked him. He had a conflict, but uh, I guess this is uh, emblematic because the government also did not find anyone to support them in terms of uh, Amici. And that, among other uh, reasons, leads me to walk out on a limb. And to the extent that you're here to hear a prediction, uh, I predict that this will be just like Sackett and unanimously go uh, for the Hawks. Now, luckily, I, I don't make a living predicting what the court does. I don't think it's possible uh, to do that. Uh, but I do think that um, uh, kind of the idea that, oh, yes, we will issue this very formal-looking government uh, uh, ruling. Oh, but no, it's not formal. It's not a ruling. It's just uh, we're just, you know, making some comments. Nice little production facility you have there. I wouldn't want anything to happen to it. Not that we're saying anything will or directing you at all in what you can do with it. Uh, but, but such as it is. And it's, uh, that's part and parcel of, of being a regulated entity of, of any kind. Uh, uh, you have all sorts of so-called guidance from the government. It's not binding. It's not formal. Um, but if you violate it uh, at some future point where they will backfill the requirements, uh, then uh, you're in a host of trouble. It's, it's very difficult to plan your business or personal affairs in such a regime. It, it, it goes uh, against the very principle of the rule of law rather than the rule of man. And here we have sort of a, a second derivative problem. Not only uh, are the statutes under which these agencies operating kind of uh, at times vague or Congress has left gaps for the agencies to fill uh, to write the law effectively, um, but here they issue these uh, guidances or non-binding, non-formal rules, etc. Uh, and uh, it's, it's kind of uncertainty building on uh, uncertainty. It's what uh, de Tocqueville uh, called the nightmare of the administrative state, the complete opposite of, uh, of, of democracy or of a Republican form uh, of government. It's to deal with concerns like these that the Administrative Procedure Act uh, was uh, enacted in 1946. It was sort of supposed to be a, a bill of rights for regulated entities. Uh, uh, and it contained within it a strong presumption uh, of reviewability. And yet, it is very difficult to challenge uh, agency uh, action, especially with these guidance documents, which are ostensibly uh, non-binding, although they often include detailed instructions for regulatory compliance um, in lieu of engaging in the more costly uh, and binding formal rulemaking process that uh, ultimately explicitly affords regulated entities uh, and individuals with opportunities for uh, judicial uh, review. Um, a large part of this is due to this one case that Professor Busby mentioned, Bennett versus Speer in 1997. That was the focus of Cato's brief. Uh, and uh, what uh, Bennett said was uh, to assess when there is finality of an agency action which triggers uh, judicial reviewability. You have to have first uh, look at whether the agency action is the consummation of the agency's decision-making process rather than being merely tentative or interlocutory in nature. Kind of an odd formulation, the consummation. So has it really finished uh, regulating you? Has it you know, consummated that? And secondly, an inquiry into whether the agency action is one uh, in which the rights or obligations have been determined 
or from which legal consequences will flow. Now, we attack that second prong in our brief. We think it's misplaced in the uh, APA context. It really is kind of a, a transfer from uh, common law standing doctrine, um, you know, whether the, the rights have changed. Uh, I think, uh, uh, as I intimated at the beginning, all these kind of guidance documents, they purport not to have, be binding or change any, any legal rules, but uh, uh, they really do have an effect uh, on the real world, whether it be property valuation or anything else. And they use these weasel words, you know, in general, this agency thinks, or you know, we will look strongly on such and such. Uh, you're not, not taking any binding position, but clearly that uh, changes something. I commend to all of you uh, an article that we cite in our brief uh, by Gwendolyn McKee, who's a practicing lawyer here in DC, called Judicial Review of Agency Guidance Documents, Rethinking the Finality Doctrine. And if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read a little bit directly from the uh, article. This will save you having to read part of the article later. So, um, uh, About a sample guidance document. In March 2007, the FDA issued a document titled Guide to Minimize Microbial Food Safety Hazards of Fresh Cut Fruits and Vegetables. I, I, I know most of you have already read this, but uh, indulge me further in explaining. Um, uh, to emphasize the non-binding nature of this document, it was subtitled Draft Final Guidance. What is a draft? I don't know. Contains non-binding recommendations. Uh, and for further emphasis, the FDA added a disclaimer after the table of contents, which reads, the guidance represents the FDA's current thinking on this topic. It does not create or confer any rights for or on any person and does not operate to bind the FDA or the public. You may use an alternative approach if the approach satisfies the requirements of the applicable statutes. If you want to discuss an alternative approach, contact the FDA staff responsible for implementing this uh, guidance. Now, in the introduction to this guidance, the FDA referenced the increasing public consumption of fresh produce and the corresponding increase in foodborne illnesses linked to such consumption. And as a statutory basis for regulation of fresh cut produce, the FDA referenced Section 201 GG of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, again, very familiar to all of you, which defines processed foods as any food other than a raw agricultural commodity and includes any raw agricultural commodity that has been subject to processing, such as canning, cooking, freezing, dehydration, uh, dehydration or milling. Um, now, the FDA claimed further uh, uh, um, uh, jurisdiction uh, over other things that were kind of incidental to those uh, types of uh, processing, um, analogizing, for example, slicing pineapples and bagging salad to the canning, cooking, freezing, dehydration, or milling requirements. But anyway, non-binding, just guidance, draft guidance at that. Um, I mean, under current case law elaborating this Bennett finality requirement, there is no way a producer of fresh cut produce could challenge the FDA's authority as stated in this guidance or presume to know what some alternative compliance mechanism would have been or even determine who the relevant person to talk to would be. Uh, it's not that the producers in question are without a right to ju judicial review. It's that the current problematic interpretation of the finan uh, finality limitation uh, prevents them from using that right to obtain uh, access uh, to the courts. Uh, Bennett encourages this weaselly and irrational uh, agency action. So I think more broadly, even beyond the specifics of the uh, U.S. Army Corps uh, action, I think there can be a broader uh, rule to be drawn. Uh, because at the end of the day, I don't buy the government's distinction here from Sackett that, oh, well, this is written on different colored paper, and the Army Corps is a completely different agency from the Environmental Protection uh, Agency and is uh, 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 acting on a completely different sub-sub-subsection of the relevant uh, Clean Water Act provision, uh, et cetera. I mean, this case, although it's very, very technical at the end of the day and hard for me to understand some of the minutiae that, that Reed is expert in, uh, being a simple constitutional lawyer myself, uh, this does lead to the broader debate over deference and non-delegation canons that were starting to spill over into uh, kind of the national uh, legal debate. And indeed, the debate over uh, Justice Scalia's successor. Now, Scalia was criticized, including by me, including by Cato, on being too deferential uh, to agency action, to being too much of a faint-hearted originalist in that, in contrast to Justice Thomas, say, or, or others. But even Justice Scalia uh, in recent years has been urging a cutting, cutting back of, for example, our deference, A-U-E-R, uh, and also making a point that unlike, say, someone like Judge Garland, uh, 
he finds in fewer cases the ambiguity necessary in the statute to then be able to just defer to whatever so-called non-arbitrary uh, judgment uh, the agency is doing. And again, that's even for formal rulemaking. This is that second derivative where it's, you know, the ambiguity built on uncertainty, built on an enigma tied around a, you know, whatever, whatever. So um, I guess I will uh, I'll leave it there, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions and learn more from the experts here. I will note also that I'm disappointed. Um, I'd heard that uh, about the Hawks business, that it involves Pete, and I got excited that there would some, be some scotch element uh, uh, to this. <laughs> Uh, but I, I encourage your clients to explore, uh, perhaps in the future, it's currently used for uh, industrial golf courses and other commercial purposes like that, but I would, uh, uh, in future, to have a more, you know, we're learning a lot about having sympathetic clients this week with the Little Sisters of the Poor and what have you. If this was a, a peat, you know, scotch distillery related thing, I think you could uh, even gain curry more PR flavor uh, uh, going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Ilya Shapiro. Um, we are going to turn to the audience for qu for questions in a minute or two, but let me uh, let me start just another quick round of of discussion from from our panelists. Um, Professor Busby made, makes I think would amount to a few policy arguments uh, at the end of his presentation that, in some ways, you could argue, um, uh, e e e even to the extent you agree with them, they just sort of reflect or uh, highlight the amount of power the government's exercising here. Um, should the court, uh, I'm asking, I guess, Ilya Shapiro and Reed Hopper, should the court concern itself with these ripple effects, uh, these policy arguments, uh, maybe the, the, the decrease in, in uh, value of land going forward if people aren't able to get these judicial determinations, if landowners can't get them? Should the court be concerned about that in this case? <clears throat> Well, there, there's an overriding policy argument uh, upon which the Administrative Procedure Act is based, and it was expressed in Abbott Labs where the court said that everyone ought to have an opportunity uh, to challenge an agency official who exceeds his, uh, his authority in court. And uh, I think that's the policy uh, that uh, the court is going to rely on. Mm -hmm. um, now, let, let me just address a, f a few specifics that Professor Busby raised. He did say that uh, um, in this case, the landowner, the Hawks, is really not put in a catch-22, no-win, Hobson's choice type, type situation. That, that certainly is not true. Um, <clears throat> Once a jurisdictional determination is issued, if it's an affirmative uh, um, JD in, in that it finds navigable waters on the property, that triggers a permit requirement um, under the statute. And uh, what, so what that means for the landowner, for, for not only for hawks, but literally tens of thousands of those who receive such jurisdictional determinations throughout the country every year is that the landowner is left with only three options and and the landowner loses big under every option number one they, they can simply walk away from their project or land uh, at a ruinous cost they can pursue a permit which may not be required and which, uh, um, and also w which is totally at the control of the uh, of the agency in in terms of of cost, uh, in timing and process, um, at at an, an astronomical cost, estimated in the Supreme Court at over two hundred and seventy thousand dollars for an individual <laughs> permit like the one at issue here in Hawks. Um, or they can simply go forward, the landowner can simply go forward with the project, ignore the jurisdictional determination, and risk civil and criminal uh, sanctions, all at ruinous cost. So there, there are practical and immediate impacts from the jurisdictional determination. I think that's, uh, uh, it's indefensible to say that there's no impact 
resulting from, uh, from this jurisdictional determination. Now, the distinction that the federal government tries to draw is that it doesn't count if, uh, if, if the impact results from the underlying statute instead of the jurisdictional determination itself. And in other words, they take the position that the jurisdictional determination has to have some sort of, of uh, um, independent force. Um, but they cite no law for that. And although the, fourth, the Fifth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit came to that conclusion, they also cite no law for that. And we have, we have express um, Supreme Court statements to the contrary. For example, it was mentioned Port of Boston, where the Supreme Court said <clears throat> you don't have to have independent um, legal significance. If you did, that means that most interpretive rules or declaratory orders would never get review in a court because they couldn't satisfy the finality requirement under the Administrative Procedure Act. And then finally, back to the policy issue, um, <clears throat> Professor Busby raised the, the, the idea that perhaps this would be adverse uh, to, uh, to landowners because uh, if we win, there will be a disincentive on the part of the agency to rely on these jurisdictional determination. Um, I would just say that uh, the facts don't bear that out. In 2015, uh, the uh, uh, Corps of Engineers issued 54,000 what are called nationwide or general permits. They issued uh, 3,100 individual permits. Of those 3,100 individual permits, only eight were administratively appealed. So. Now, virtually, if, if we win this case, there's not going to be a rush, uh, there's not going to be a floodgate uh, opening up uh, people coming to, uh, uh, to court to challenge these. As the court said in Sackett, only when it's clear in the mind of the landowner that there really has been an error of judgment on the part of the agency will they go to court. Uh, to challenge it because the cost is just too high. So I think that uh, it's unlike, my, to, to, to underscore that, let me just say uh, in conclusion that the agency has more to gain by continuing with the, with the JD process than the landowners have to lose because <clears throat> by virtue of the fact that only eight of these were ever appealed administratively suggests that 99.9% .9 of the time <clears throat> the landowner is simply going to defer to the agency when they get a, uh, an affirmative jurisdictional determination. That works to the benefit of the agency because they have very little likelihood of ever being challenged uh, if they get it wrong. Professor Busby, you were yeah, just, to um, I, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing from you as well on why there are no briefs in support of the government. Not, not a single okay. environmental okay. group or... Um, well, I guess, first, on this, the point he was saying about the Hobson's choice, and so Reed said it was untrue that there were no, no Hobson's choice to create, and then at the end he correctly characterized the difference between uh, the action, the jurisdictional determination creating impacts and Hobson's choices or the statute. My point is actually just under the cases, the cases, especially the Abbott Labs case and the Sackett case, the cases focus on the government action creating that immediate conundrum, that lose, lose either way choice. And so the court maybe will go further in here. That's why it would be an expansion. If the court uh, rules in favor of Reed and his client, it would be going further because it would be just saying the fact that the statute itself is a powerful or onerous statute, the fact that you know you're subject to it would be enough. And so that's why it's a difference. So whether the court will accept that, I'm not sure, but it is a difference from the two main precedents. They don't go as far as uh, Reed is suggesting. I think much of the, I, I suspect the oral argument, a substantial part will hinge on that question. Does the court view this as a distinction that matters or not? Um, as far as the briefs, I'm not sure what happened. I mean, uh, the Army Corps grants permits where it shouldn't, and it denies, I mean, it, it makes negative declarations when it shouldn't, and maybe it, sometimes it makes affirmative when it shouldn't. 
for the environmental community, the ability to go to court early is going to be a boon. So I wouldn't be surprised that if the citizen suit litigators will be viewing this and it's not a lose, it's a, it's a tough call. You know, my own sense here truly is something my, the, the first article I wrote about, many of you went to sleep trying to read it, um, uh, was actually on the, the importance of government clarity. And so right now you have a process where the government is quite willing to give people guidance about their status and I just think it's, whether it's going to be slowing it down or narrowing its applicability or increasing the burden, I don't think that you're going to see if, if the Hawks win, I would be shocked if it remained as equally available as it is now. I just think, and so, you know, and so, I, so why people in the environmental community, it's, it's not clearly good or bad either way. Um, you know, that is the Army Corps. Having the, if, if the Army Corps could be guaranteed to do top-notch, high quality work using peer reviewed science and there's this big con connectivity report with all the peer reviewed science on waters of the United States and their functioning. If the Army Corps did a spectacular job, I think everyone would applaud. There'd be fewer challenges on both sides. So if, if the Army Corps is getting some percentage of these wrong, mm -hmm. is that, is that, does everybody agree that the, there's some number of these the army gets wrong in one direction or another and what is a landowner to do if not appeal to court that well don't forget the next thing so if someone is trying to figure out what to do i mean the, the the matters i'm aware of so a lot of them is people are figuring out which portions of their property they can use so very often the easiest thing is just tell me like i was talking to one real estate a large real estate developer years ago and his answer in a conversation like this was I don't care what the law, I just want to know what the law is. Just, just give me that clarity about my obligations and I'll find a way to build houses and sell them. But, but and, an affirmative jurisdictional determination has to decrease the value of land. I'm not going to buy a piece of property I can't develop. Well, don't forget that. If that's the case, and if sometimes they've gotten wrong, mm -hmm. uh, the, the core makes a mistake, what is, what's a homeowner, a landowner to do in that circumstance? Uh, my, my sense is the way it will play out is the following. So first, very often, there, you may be unhappy with the 60 acres you lose, but happy with the 400 acres that remain open to development, right? And so, so one possibility would be it's still clarity, they'll proceed, and now it suddenly becomes Lakeview estates instead of <laughs> you know, dry estates. Um, um, so that's one possibility. The second is I think that people will um, uh, decide whether to apply for a permit. That is, if the stakes are high enough and if they think that they're right, on the science and the data and the information, and it's worth it, they will challenge it. I think that, uh, to me, actually, that the most powerful part of your brief and some of the others is, as it is now, because uh, uh, jurisdictional determinations can't go straight to court, it does add to the bargaining power of the Army Corps. That is, and so kind of going into it, the power is skewed. The Army Corps you know, has some expertise, and so that may be the most powerful thing here, and that would be the difference. But bottom line is, I think people will decide whether to challenge, but any clarity is what people often seek. Questions so. from the audience? Can I just address the Professor Busby's slippery slope uh, point? I think that, uh, well, two things first. Uh, get standing doctrine right, so whether under the Laid Law case or otherwise, yeah, if you're a downstream owner from literally a stream, uh, sure, you should be able to challenge what somebody's been doing up there. That affects you directly. But if you just a, have a generalized grievance because you're a taxpayer or, or what have you, an activist, uh, then you shouldn't. Uh, so get that right. But even more importantly is get the scope of the relative agency right so that they're not going after gravel uh, uh, lots or uh, I don't know why a, a, a peat bog is a water of the U.S. Nobody is going swimming there, whether you're in the whether the bog is in Eastern Europe or, or in America. No one's uh, sending pleasure craft down it or otherwise navigating towards the ocean. Um, so I think the, the scope of uh, regulatory authority needs to be severely curtailed uh, and uh, legislatively. Um, I don't think we can depend on, on agencies to cut their own uh, wings, so to speak. But once you get the the, the, the substance of the matter right, uh, I think these second derivative or even first derivative uh, uh, concerns become less important. Did, did you just say that uh, the, one of the virtues of the jurisdictional determinations 
is it gives clarity so that the landowner knows what his obligations are. At least lets them know, they know what the government's view is about what they can use and what yeah, they can't. Isn't that the definition of final agency action, determination of obligations? Well, the thing is, it then allows them to figure out do they need to apply for a permit or not. In other words, at least when I was advising industry as a private sector lawyer, you know, people were always just wanted to figure out, even in settings of uncertainty, as much as they could probabilistically, where their opportunities stood. And so, so I think that's why people often want guidance. They want it, but it, that also... Well, they don't want to lose, but they want it. But you have to remember all those who want it and get what they mm -hmm. want as well as the ones who lose. In other words, it's the systemic, Im the Supreme Court will be focusing on the systemic impacts of the ruling, not just one person who's unhappy. And so how they will play that out, I'm not sure, but that's what the court has to think about is the overall scheme and what happens with one rule or the other. We've got a few minutes left for audience questions. Anybody have a question? Paul Kaminar, wait for the microphone, please. Hi, I'm Paul Kamen, our attorney and senior fellow of the Administrative Conference. Um, I have a, a couple questions here. Um, in terms of the uh, federal jurisdiction over wetlands, of course, many states also regulate wetlands. I was just curious in the Hawks case whether the state had already indicated that this was a wetland. And also, in terms of the uh, Delineation, yes, as the professor says, you know, they could say, well, this part is a wetland, this part is not. It seems to me that peat bogs are basically wetlands by the three parameters, soil, vegetation, hydrology. Uh, but the big question is, where is the interstate commerce connection? And, and it seems to me that that, uh, that kind of determination is one where, you know, uh, the uh, uh, property owners should be able to determine, look, this may be regulated by the state. And if the state says, this is not a wetland or it's not worth the candle, there, I can build on it. But you're claiming that because you saw uh, some vegetation here and that it's connected somehow hydrology-wise, that, that that should be able to be determined. And, and finally, in terms of the Hobson's choice, it seems to me that, that if you do apply for a permit, that, that um, even if the, you have the jurisdictional delineation saying, yes, it is, uh, what, what, I mean, I had a client who went to prison for three years uh, uh, for putting topsoil on a, on a piece of property that the core claim was a wetland, but there was no uh, interstate commerce connection. So, so uh, there is this option of choice. If you apply for the permit, can you apply for it basically real quick saying, look, I just want to put something on this piece of property. I'm applying for it under protest because I don't think you have jurisdiction and get that quickly denied and then seek a declaratory judgment that this property is not subject, you know, to, to, to the court's jurisdiction, as opposed to, like, my client having to go to prison for daring to, to uh, think that in America he could uh, use his property in a reasonable way. It, it, is, uh, it is important to point out that this is not a, a case in which the, um, this, does, this case does not turn on whether the uh, peat bogs constitute wetlands. That's acknowledged by Hawks. It's acknowledged by the state. It's acknowledged by the Corps. So, but all, all wetlands are not jurisdictional. And uh, so the question here, are these particular peat bogs jurisdictional? The, uh, the Corps of Engineers, when it, when it is issued its initial jurisdictional determination, um, relied on the uh, there, there are two standards under the Rapanos decision, as, as you pointed out. Uh, one is whether the, <clears throat> the uh, a wetland is adjacent to a relatively permanent water body. Uh, the other one is whether there's a significant nexus. This was Justice Kennedy's uh, sole opinion. The uh, jurisdictional determination initially relied on the first approach, saying that this was a wetland it was subject to federal control because it was next to a, a, a relatively permanent stream. Um, however, they backed off when uh, the uh, Hawks presented uh, contrary um, data from their consultant. So the jurisdictional determination was revised. And when it was revised, the Corps says, we're going to rely on the significant nexus. The significant nexus, they claims they claim, is that there's a continuous surface water connection from these wetlands to the Red River of the North 
120 miles away and that that has a significant physical, biological, and chemical uh, impact on those waters. Now, when, um, when that was issued, that became the, f the, the, the final um, jurisdictional determination. And that's what Hawks um, appealed to the, uh, uh, to the reviewing officer within the uh, Corps itself. And the reviewing officer said that this is invalid because you didn't do any quantitative or qualitative hydrological studies. So there are no, there's no flow information to support your continuous nexus um, conclusion. Therefore, um, the, uh, the challenge is valid. When it went back on remand, the district engineer, according to the complaint, reissued um, essentially the same jurisdictional determination without filling in any of the gaps, the data gaps, that the reviewing officer said was required. Um, what was your other question? Uh, well, I think that's basically in terms of if it's a, if it's a Congress question, that that should be judicially reviewable because... Yeah, you had another question. I, I think he started by asking, where is the commerce? Yeah, Well, yeah, yeah, but you got it. It's 120 miles, so I could see how far <clears throat> Yeah, there, but, but you had another, is, another question, to too, about, about the permit process. I think there was some marijuana growing there, so there's the, there's the Congress. <laughs> oh, can you, right. Well, th that's the problem. Uh, you, you, um, the, uh, um, w one, of, one of the difficulties I, I see in the uh, position the government has taken is that the uh, permit process as to cost and timing is completely at the discretion of the agency. The agency need not uh, ever um, give you a, a decision. They can simply ask for more and more and more information and claim that the application for the permit has never been complete and never issue a, a, uh, a denial or a grant, so you have nothing to take to court. And again, they can they can they can spread that out over years, and there and we cite cases that do that. Um, but more importantly, more importantly, um, the 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 question is why why should one have to go through the permit process in order to determine whether the permit process was required? Um, there's it, it's it's absurd on its face. And, and the, the government acknowledges that, <clears throat> that uh, the permit process adds nothing to the legal question of whether there's jurisdiction. It's just there. It's just a process. It's just a hurdle. And its only purpose is to add cost and delay. I'm afraid we're going to have to let that be the final word. Uh, please join me in thanking our panel and uh, join us at the reception. Nice job. Nice job.